Hello everybody, how are you doing? And welcome back for another episode of Boozy's Legal Funhouse, episode 8, Who Owns the Dead? I am your host, the Boozy Barrister, Boozy Badger, here to talk to you tonight about property ownership of a corpse. That's right, the decaying mass we leave after we pass from this world into the great hereafter. But before we do that, as always, I have to read off the names of the Patreon supporters of Boozy's Legal Funhouse and all the stuff I do over here. At the $5 level and above, our producers are Jeremy the Head Fox and Dragor, Nikolai, Tezcat, Magic Jag, Waylon DeRoche, Beaten, Dozer the Trash Panda, Eddie the Weather Fox, Mark Beckwar, Mama T, Uncle Kage, Lisa Lupe, Mark Phaedrus, Netherlinks, Pandemonium Hawk, Petrov Neutrino, Scott Skunk, Tyranth, Buddy Goodboy Esquire, CC Otter, Chroma Hydra, David Hunter, Ed B. Cali, Fick, Ghost Goat, Grace Jane, Gullinger, Ian Delahorn, Jason Knight, Just Dave, Calic, Coma Blood Paul, Mark Whipple, Michael Blocker, Sean Rabbit, The Dragon Show, Wheelie, and Zeros the Lion. Special thanks to all of you. And remember throughout tonight's episode, if you enjoy the things we do here, you can always become one of our Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash lawyers and liquor, which will give you access to our supporter discord where you can do things such as ask questions during these episodes. Now, before we get started, because we are talking about legal principles tonight, I have to do a standard disclaimer. Boozy's Legal Funhouse is an informational and educational and hopefully entertaining podcast regarding general legal principles. Nobody can know the law in every state and jurisdiction. Please do not take this as specific legal advice. While I am a licensed attorney, I am not your attorney. The only way I become your attorney is if you have consulted with me in my office. I have discussed your case, agreed to take your case. You have signed an engagement letter with me and paid me a retainer of my choosing. No attorney-client privilege will attach to anything discussed tonight. And, for the love of God, check with a licensed attorney in your area before applying any of these specific principles we speak of tonight to your daily life. Do not just say a fat man who acts like a cartoon badger on the internet told me to do this. That said and done, we've got a wonderful informational segment for you tonight but before we get into that we need to discuss that's right the legal news roundup where we talk about three pieces of legal news our first one tonight comes to us as most of them do from the american bar association journal in this matter uh from march the 3rd of 2021 Comic books are serious business. Yes, they are, especially when there are allegations of mass conspiracies involved with the same. What am I talking about? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Marvel CEO seeks punitive damages for alleged theft of, get this, his DNA during a deposition. That's right. The Marvel chief executive officer, Isaac Ike. Perlmutter has sought punitive damages against Chubb Insurance for allegedly facilitating the death theft of his DNA during a deposition. He alleges that the genetic material was obtained during the deposition and intended to help bolster a claim that he and his wife were behind a hate mail campaign targeting their Florida neighbor, Toronto businessman Harold Pirenboom. At the deposition, the Perlmutters were asked to inspect certain exhibits and offered bottles of water. DNA from those exhibits and those bottles of water were then collected and sent for testing to determine whether the Perlmutters had sent out large amounts of, <laughs> of hate mail to their neighbor. 
Uh, the dispute between the neighbors, which has led to the DNA theft, began when Perenboom proposed competitive bidding on a contract to operate tennis facilities at the gated community of Sloan's Curve. The tennis pro who oversees the facilities claimed Perenboom defamed her and mailings and then sued. Perlmutter didn't want the tennis pro to be replaced, and Perenboom accused him of funding the tennis pro's lawsuit. This was followed by an anonymous hate mail campaign where letters were sent to Perenboom's friends and associates accusing him of quote-unquote loathsome crimes. What type of loathsome crimes? Well, murder and sexual assault of a minor. You know, the typical accusations you make when you're having a dispute with your neighbor. Oh my god. First, I want to point out that everybody involved in this case has like the richest fucking name humanly possible. Ike, Isaac, Ike, Perlmutter, Harold Pirenboom. My God, it's like Jane Austen wrote this. And the dispute over a tennis pro <laughs> has somehow turned into accusations of murder and sexual assault being mailed to neighbors. Good fences make good neighbors. But you know what makes good neighbors more than good fences? Not accusing them of fucking killing a person. Man, this is, um, oh, oh, wow. It, it actually goes forward uh, in this to say a fired employee of uh, Mandrake uh, was uh, supposedly at, at, uh, at the center of this. Uh, sending out letters to prisoners accusing Peter and Boom of child molestation unless he leaves Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, Perlmutter says that he has now been exonerated of the claims that he mailed those letters out. But Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> I... <laughs> Let's uh. Let's move from rich folks having disputes over tennis pros to something uh, a little more lighthearted. Uh, on March the 4th, the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit uh, determined that certain businesses, uh, one business specifically, was not entitled to receive paycheck protection loans. That business, well, that would be Pharaoh's GC, Inc. And what does the GC stand for, you ask? I hear you crying into my ears, boozy, please tell us. Pharaoh's GC, Inc., stands for Pharaoh's Gentlemen's Club, Inc. That's right. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, August term of 2020, a lawsuit was filed appealing a lower court ruling that gentlemen's clubs could not receive paycheck protection loans from the Small Business Association. The reasoning behind this is that no SBA guarantee would be given to businesses presenting live performances of a purient sexual nature. Pharaohs, which is a business featuring nude dancing, sought a preliminary injunction against small business administration regulations preventing such loans and requesting that they be granted a paycheck protection loan. The Second Circuit, on hearing the district court's argument striking down Pharaoh's ability to receive one of these loans, determined that that court did not abuse its discretion, that Pharaoh's was unlikely to succeed on its claims, uh, that the SBA exceeded its statutory authority and promulgating eligibility restrictions, and the exclusion of nude dancing establishments was not a violation of of the First or the Fifth Amendment. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting read, and I'll actually, in the uh, information for this episode, have the link up to the CARES Act and all of that uh, regarding the exclusions of this. But 76 employees of this establishment, or establishments, the chain, uh, are, are not entitled to paycheck protection loans uh, under 
this. Uh, arguments were brought under the APA, which is the Administrative Procedures Act regarding regulations and showing that, uh, that they, they had a good faith reason and a good reason to deny it. Uh, that kind of brings us into a question more suited for a First Amendment attorney than me, because uh, I would love to say that I am very experienced in the area of uh, gentlemen's clubs and nude dancing and First Amendment concerns, but only half of that would be true. I, I can't say I have explored much in the way of the First Amendment considerations that come into play with nude dancing and gentlemen's clubs outside of knowing that it can be a valid exercise of the state's police power to bar them from certain areas. The state's police power obviously being things like the health, safety, and welfare of the general public, including in many cases, the moral welfare. That's why you'll see rules out there saying that a gentleman's club or a new dancing establishment or uh, an adult bookstore cannot be within a certain distance of certain things such as schools or churches for zoning purposes. Uh, very much, though, an interesting read, especially if you're like me and you are a bit of a geek when it comes to administrative law. Finally, and this is something I know a bit about, uh, there is another First Amendment case coming up in front of the Supreme Court. This case is the Mahanoy Area School District versus BL, a minor at the time of filing. This case is uh, actually a really good one to look at. Uh, the news related to it is the Department of Justice has entered this case by filing an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, on the side of the Mahanoy Area School District. But what is the genesis of this brief, uh, which you can read? I'm going to put it up right now uh, in the air. What is the genesis of this? Well, it's actually a very good question that they're asking whether the First Amendment categorically prohibits public school officials from disciplining students for speech that occurs off campus. Uh, it is actually a very important case. To, to give you an idea of the importance, there's a number of First Amendment cases that concern a student's right to speech, and they uh, generally will hold uh, under what we call the Tinker v. Des Moines standard, that a student does not surrender their free speech right, their constitutional protections, when they enter the schoolhouse gate. However, those same protections can be limited by the school. And a series of determinations after Tinker, uh, including the Bong Hits for Jesus case, have held that the schoolhouse gates are not simply the physical confines of the school, but extend to things such as uh, the school property or can come back into the school. So this is actually a case that has a, a good question. The, the facts are a young lady was unhappy that she had been cut from the varsity cheerleading team uh, and took to Snapchat to express her disappointment in a profane manner. That was a Snapchat. That Snapchat actually uh, was set to expire. However, people reached out. They saw this Snapchat. School officials saved this Snapchat where the young lady was profanely discussing not getting onto the varsity team and was then punished for it. Because the speech was regarding a school activity, the Mahanoy Area School District came in and said, we can punish you for that speech. We have the ability to punish you, even though it occurred completely off campus, even though it occurred outside of school hours, we can punish you for speech that is regarding a school activity, especially an extracurricular activity, uh, and hold it against you in 
the future, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals came back and said, no, you can't do that. We've said you can't do that before. It has to be directly related to school activities and likely, and there's a whole test regarding it. Uh, and then after that, it came in that the Fifth Circuit had ruled the opposite way shortly before that. So there is now what we call a circuit split. The circuit split being, can the school hold that type of speech responsible? Or can't the school hold that type of speech responsible? And as we know, when there is a circuit split between the appellate circuits, the place to resolve it is in front of the United States Supreme Court, which is now taking it up. This is one to actually keep your eyes on because it could have wide-ranging impacts on the ability of schools to monitor, punish, and abrogate the speech of students moving forward. And that will wrap up the portion of tonight where we're talking about the legal news. We'll look up for more cases next week, but until then, let's move on to tonight's topic. Tonight's topic is very simply, who owns your body when you die? We've all heard about this. I want to be fired out of a cannon like Hunter S. Thompson. I want to be taxidermy. My personal desire for my body when I die is I would like to be stuffed and placed in the closet of my youngest living descendant on a roller track with a green black light a backlight and a, and a fog machine. And every night at precisely midnight, my body, completely powered by hydraulics, will shoot out of the closet at top speed towards the edge of their bed, looking exactly as I did after my first stroke with a recording of me saying, Hello, Billy! And in order to continue to receive my inheritance... My children, their parents, can never acknowledge that my corpse is in the closet. They must look directly into the corpse and say, there's nothing in there. Can I do that, though? Is that within my ability? Well, probably not. Probably not. And I, I see... Somebody, if you're not aware, we record this show live on the Twitch channel. And somebody in the Twitch just said, oh, your massive inheritance. That's right. My massive inheritance of two jelly beans and a bottle of bourbon. The boozy family fortune. That brings us, though, to tonight's topic, which is who owns your body? Who owns your decaying Corpse. As always, for the people who are listening, I'm sorry that you can't see the PowerPoint I've spent time putting together, but you know where you can see it. Patreon. It's posted there after each stream when this episode goes live on your favorite podcast service for our Patreon supporters of all levels to review. Who owns your decaying corpse? Well, the first thing that you have to realize is you actually have no rights after you die. Upon death, you cease to exist, not only as a person, but as a legal entity. Now I know what you're thinking, Boozy. That's a rather firm statement to make. I believe in the afterlife, and I've been a good Christian and said all my prayers and asked my daddy to forgive me in that small, dark closet in the corner of the church. How dare you assume that upon my death I will cease to exist? And this is where I need to remind you. The law does not concern itself with the afterlife. The law is concerned only with your existence and the here and the now on this plane. Also, there are no lawyers in the great hereafter. And if you subscribe to a Judeo-Christian belief system, I will be the first to assure you, there are no lawyers in heaven. When you die, what happens first is an estate is formed. 
At the moment of your death, there is a legal entity or an entity getting ready to spring into existence called your estate. This forms at the moment of your death, and it includes all the property you own, such as real estate, bank accounts, etc. That estate is the thing that has the legal authority to act after your death. This estate, for all intents and purposes, becomes you. And, well, you just don't own yourself. As stated by the Middle District of Pennsylvania, uh, the United States District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania on April 19, 2013, in a ruling by Judge Caputo in Thorpe v. Thorpe, docket number CV 101317. Consistent with the law generally, the body of one whose estate is in probate is not part of the property of the estate. An estate only deals with property that you actually owned at the time of your death and at common law, which is the law developed over centuries of <clears throat> jurisprudence. That, uh, that's just a fancy term for what courts in England decided a long fucking time ago. There is no property right in human remains. And this includes your own remains. This is well settled law, almost black letter law, meaning it is law that we all know that as a legal practitioner, when somebody says, who owns my body? You say, don't no one own your body. At common law. There is no property right in the body of a deceased person. That body forms no part of the property of one's estate in the usual sense, as do other chattels or property. Chattels, by the way, simply being a fancy term for personal property. That comes to us from 22A Amjur 2nd Edition, Dead Bodies, Section 3. Amjur is just a, a shorthand term for American jurisprudence, which is a legal encyclopedia of well-accepted principles of law. This is what we refer to as the majority position, and that the majority, if not all, of the states accept this position. There is no property right, either to the decedent, their estate, or others, that can exist in a human body. Cases which cite this general principle, that exact language, appear in Pennsylvania law, in Illinois law, in California law, in New York law, and pretty much in every state's law. But does this mean that you, as a person, have no say whatsoever in how your body is handled? After you die? Does it mean that if you express wishes to be cremated, your family can go, nope, I'm going to stuff his ass and put him in the closet? Which, for some people, would be a step back to where they were when living. Well, no. Most states have a provision in law that allows for a person to express their wishes regarding the disposition of their remains after death. Disposition, once again, in this context, being a legal term that simply means what happens to the body. The requirements of valid dis uh, dispositions, expressions of those wishes, will be considered by the court, and uh, they vary by state. We have a couple examples here, such as uh, the Pennsylvania one, where uh, under 20 PACS, Pennsylvania Consolidated Statutes 305, uh, A, it states the general rule, the determination of the final disposition of a decedent's remains shall be as set forth unless otherwise specifically provided by way of an agreement of the person subject to the provisions of their will which is the important language there, subject to the provisions of their will. 
That law basically says if a decedent says in a written document that meets the requirements of a will how they want their body disposed of, this court will give deference to that. And likewise, the Illinois statute, 755 ILCS 65-5. Unless a decedent has left directions in writing for the disposition. There we go. Once again, a decedent can direct the disposition of their body. You have a right, as long as it is done in a legally permissible way, to determine or direct people how to handle your body upon death. But it must be done in whatever way is specified in your state statutes. There's at least some cases out there where somebody did not follow the procedure set out, did not have it in the appropriate form, and the court said, nope, fuck that, and didn't allow for it. And what happens in those situations? Well, we'll get to that. But I heard you say a moment ago, when I said most states, what the fuck do you mean most states allow me to determine what happens to my body after death? Is there some state that has decided I have no say in the matter? Well, sort of. You see, at common law, that law handed down from England, there was no right of a dead person to direct the disposition of their remains. That came to us from an 1882 case in England called Williams v. Williams. Under that case, the party most responsible for the disposition of human remains was the executor or the administrator of the estate, the person who is held to be the representative of the legal entity that you become upon death. In jurisdictions where there is no statute that specifically allows or no case law that specifically allows for the decedent to determine and direct the disposition of their body after death, well, that common law would still apply. However, there is a caveat. Generally, American courts are more likely to consider, if not exactly follow, the expressed wishes of a decedent in determining what the proper distribution of our disposition, not distribution, you're not cutting the corpse up and handy. I mean, maybe you are. I don't fucking know. I'm not, I'm not sure what your religion entails. Maybe you are distributing the body. Disposition of an estate. And what if you're silent on it, though? Say you don't have any expressed wishes. Say you have not decided what you want to happen to your body upon your death. What happens then? Now, you ever seen that movie Soylent Green? In all seriousness, the law expects that the people surviving you, the people you leave behind upon your death, your loved ones, friends, and family members, are going to fight about just about fucking everything. Generally, generally, in the vast majority of states, if not all the states, there are specific laws regarding who gets to determine what happens to your body after you die. And much like if you don't leave a will, those laws set out orders of who's going to make that determination, who's going to decide whether you're buried, whether you're cremated, whether you're taxidermied and stuffed in the closet. <coughs> the law does provide. For example, under Pennsylvania law, we're looking once again at 20 PACS 305. 305 sets out who can make a disposition of it, and it identifies it as being the next of kin. It then defines who the next of kin is. The next of kin, in this case, under Pennsylvania law, would be the people identified by the intestate code, 20 PACS 2103, for intestate secession if you die without a will, and in that order. 
It then states that if there is a dispute between several people in the same class, that it will either be resolved by a majority vote or by the courts. Now, what does this mean? Let's say you die without a spouse, because under this current Pennsylvania law that we're discussing, your spouse is always your next of kin, except in certain situations, uh, such as enduring estrangement, incompetence, contrary intent or waiver, or an agreement in writing proven by clear and convincing evidence. Your spouse is always the next of kin who gets to make that determination. If they don't, it goes under the intestate code. Well, the very first level of the Intestate Secession Act says issue. Issue not being like the Marvel CEO's additions out there, but rather speaking of children, lineal descendants, people of your body that have sprung forth and will continue the family line. Let's say you have four kids. Two of your kids decide that they want to bury you. Two of your kids decide that they want to cremate you. None of them can come to an agreement. What happens within 48 hours of the dispute? A petition is filed with the court, and the court then makes that determination. But say one of them wants to bury you, three of them want to cremate you. It's a majority rule. You're going to be burned, motherfucker. They're going to toss your ass on the fire pit and light it up. Roast some s'mores over grandma. Now you may be asking, it's my body. I lived in it. I destroyed it. I made all the problems with it. Why can't I figure out what the hell I want to do with it at the end of my life? And the answer, as so many things regarding how we control our bodies uh, is, uh, you may make judgmental sky grandpa angry. That's right. You see... Our laws regarding human bodies, corpses, are heavily influenced by ecclesiastical precedent. What does that mean? Well, for a long time, there were generally two big areas of law. There was the common law, and that was all the court decisions. The uh, judges sitting there and listening to things, and saying, it seems like good policy to me. And then there was ecclesiastical law. And ecclesiastical law was law as handed down by the church. Speaking specifically about England, because so much of the United States common law is derived from merry old England, we would be talking about first the Roman Catholic Church and then the Anglican churches. The ecclesiastical jurisdiction included much of what we now consider to be questions of pure law, uh, questions that don't, in our modern thought, include spiritual or religious questions, such as power over crimes committed by the clergy. If a priest committed a crime in the olden times, their crime would be heard by an ecclesiastical court, not a civil court because a civil court did not have authority over the servants of God. Sole power in making determinations of church property. Sole power over questions of marriage, divorce, progeny. Sole power for the probate and control of wills and estates regarding personal property. And in general, the sole power in questions that affect faith or morality in general. A lot of power given to God. And under the probate and faith immorality, it was generally accepted. What happened to your body after death was a question not of civil law, but a question of church law. Historically, in merry old England, bodies were considered to be the exclusive property and purview of the church. Why, you may ask? Well, the church controlled the burial process. The body was buried in a churchyard, or determined not to be eligible to be buried in a churchyard. And it was the church's little creepy, crawly worms that would wriggle in and out of your coffin as you slowly decomposed. 
Now, you may think that last one's a little silly, but there's a Latin phrase, caro data verbibus, and it translates to flesh given to the worms. And what does that mean? No shit. It was the actual legal term used by ecclesiastical courts in referring to a dead body. Caro data vermibus. Generally, it was a question of faith and morality because we had accepted as a society that bodies deserved respect. As the mortal remains of once living people and the belief in church values, it was generally held that bodies would deserve respect. Those empty vessels, we respected them more than, say, an empty soda can, an empty Miller Lite can, an empty bottle of bourbon. Because of that, the handling and preparation of bodies became the sole purview of ecclesiastical courts and were placed in the trust of that court. It's, uh, it's one of the reasons you can't be turned into a modern art project when you die. They don't just get to slice off your arms and go, it's a testament to mankind's struggle against the landlord class. And this actually bled over into the law law, the general moral principle of you can't abuse a corpse. For example, uh, 18 PACS 5510, that is the portion of the Pennsylvania Consolidated Statutes known as the Pennsylvania Criminal Code, states that abuse of a corpse is except as authorized by law, a person treating a corpse in a way that he or she or they, the law is gendered many times, would outrage ordinary family sensibilities and classifies it as a misdemeanor of the second degree. So, a quick question. Does this mean that as long as the family is okay with how a corpse is treated, it isn't abuse of a corpse. Say your family's fine with your dead body being hollowed out and used as a fuck toy at a BDSM club. Does this mean that the law does not consider that abuse of a corpse? Of course not. The standard we apply here is an objective standard, one that is based on general community principles, not a subjective standard based on the specific family in question. The law doesn't look to whether your specific family is fine with 20 guys railing grandpa in a dimly lit room on a Saturday night. Rather, it looks at whether an ordinary family would be outraged at how the corpse of their relative is being treated. And things that are barred by this, or can be barred by this, are concepts such as taxidermy of a body. Doesn't matter what my wishes are. Abuse of a corpse would prevent people from taxidermying my body. Dismemberment of the body, that modern art project we've gotten into. Defleshing a cadaver to preserve the bone. Mutilation or disrespect of a corpse in general. It's important to note, though, and to remember, that at one point, this included cremation. At one point, cremating a body was considered to be outrageous conduct that would infuriate the sensibilities of the surviving family members. Indeed, that case we talked about earlier, Williams v. Williams, the, uh, the case regarding the lack of property right in a body, was actually triggered by a case of cremation in 1882. When Williams died, 
he had directed he wanted to be cremated. When his widow went to carry this out, the court stopped it. Well, didn't really stop it so much as sought reimbursement for it. The body was burned. You can't put it back together at that point. <coughs> I should be very clear. Williams got lit the fuck up. But when they applied for payment, the court said, no, the proper party to dispose of this body should have been the administrator of the estate, which you were not, Miss Widow. And as such, and as the administrator would not have disposed of the body in that manner, we will not reimburse the cost of cremation. It's generally accepted. The reasoning behind that holding was at that time, under Anglo-Saxon English jurisprudence, there was a discouragement of cremation. Bodies were buried, not burned. Which brings up a point here. Why do the prudes get to tell me, the man who destroyed his body, that I cannot be used as an after-death sex toy if I so wish? Well, it all goes back to the state's power. As I discussed just a little earlier, the state has a valid police power interest in the disposal of human remains. The police power is the state's ability to control individual and private acts or rights in the interest of the community as a whole. Generally, this power is exercised for the health safety, and or welfare of the community, but welfare generally includes the moral welfare of a community. It's the exact same principle that communities use when zoning out adult entertainment areas under zoning ordinances. It's based on the community standards of acceptability within certain reasonable areas. Even if it didn't have a moral justification, even if the state telling you you can't do that had no moral justification, though, such as the abuse of corpse provisions, which is what that really is, the state would still have a legitimate interest in governing what you can and cannot do with a dead body under health and safety justifications due to unsanitary or health concerns raised by just leaving a corpse around and going to town on it. To some extent, the laws relating to disposition, disposal, and protection of human corpses are kind of like post-mortem zoning ordinances, restrictions of things that can or cannot be done with a body. Except, remember, Nobody, no single person, has a property right in a human body. And you may be asking yourself, we've talked a lot about moral justifications, fucking corpses, all of those things. How is any of that related to property? Well, while you have a right to request that your body be disposed of in a specific manner, fired out of a cannon, cremated, buried at sea, courts, while generally seeking to adhere to that, will recognize you have no right to demand your body be disposed of in that way. For example, let's go back to my sincere wish that I be taxidermied and put in my descendants' closet to just terrify them for several generations to come. I want to be the hand-me-down boogeyman of the Badger family. Well, where a disposition would be illegal, impractical, unreasonable, or likely to cause hardship, your wishes don't matter. The person disposing of your body is not required to fly 
uh, across the globe to deposit your ashes on the top of Mount Everest if they can't afford to do so. They're not required to bury you in the Caribbean. They're not required to grind you up into hamburger meat and make special little death burgers of you to be served at your funeral. Those are ways that it would violate the law to do that. The same thing with taxidermy. If it would result in a charge of abuse of a corpse or force a funeral director to break an ethical standard, you have no right to have your body disposed of in that manner, and they have every right to disregard. This abrogation of your wishes is specifically because your body is not property of the estate. This can change, though. Currently, the question of whether something is abuse of a corpse or not is based on what society is willing to accept as reasonable. Remember, this is all based on the idea of abuse of a corpse being outrageous, such that it would outrage an ordinary family. Say, in the next 20 years, it becomes readily acceptable to taxidermy your loved ones and prop them up in a closet to scare the younger generations. Well, changing times can and will change the definition of what is ordinary, of what is outrageous, of what would offend the sensibilities of a family in our fair community. And while it's unlikely that the law will ever change to allow you to donate your body to a kink club. Societal norms could certainly change enough that taxidermy would be a completely allowable method of that. As discussed earlier, it's already happened. It's already happened. 140 years ago, cremation was outrageous conduct. Now, it is a typical and inexpensive way of disposing of a body. Now, I hear you as we get here, which is, if I don't own my body, if my family does not own my body, who owns it? Whose body is that? Well, the law owns your dead ass. Generally, human bodies are treated as being in custodia legis, a fancy Latin way of saying within the custody of the law. What this means is that treatment, internment, disinternment, reinternment, and generally control of a human corpse is within the sole discretion of the court and not subject to any standard property considerations. Even relatives don't get an actual property right in your body. Instead, they obtain what we refer to as a quasi-property interest, and then generally only for the limited purposes of making a disposition, a burial of your body. It terminates at the moment of internment, the second you're in the ground, their interest ends. What's the effect of that determination? Of the courts are in custody of your body. Well, because nobody has a property interest in your corpse, nobody gets to claim it as theirs. Now, that has an obvious impact family-wise. Could you imagine a family fighting over grandma's ashes constantly? Jesus, that would be horrible. I'm sure nobody out there has ever experienced that. But more importantly, it means matters relating to your corpse are handled by the court. The court gets to step in. The court gets to say, hey, you're all being dumbasses, and this body's rotting in the back room. We're going to figure out how to fucking dispose of it. You all present your best cases, then sit down and shut the fuck up while we, uh, our, our learned justices, figure it out. It also means your body cannot be levied on or held for payment of your debts. And I hear you saying, can we talk about that last one? 
for a second? Can we that that part about people seizing my body for payment of my debts? Can we go back to that? And I, I would like to say we certainly fucking can. You see, prior to 1804 in England, it was totally not illegal for someone who you owed money to to seize your corpse and hold it or otherwise refuse to release it to your family for burial in order to force them into paying past due debts. This principle, more than anything, has added to the concept of a human body cannot be property. Why? Because property, as we've covered before, can be used to satisfy debts. We don't tend to let that happen anymore, to the extent that most states have actively prohibited even funeral homes from holding, refusing to release, or refusing to transfer human remains as a result of non-payment even for a funeral debt. There is no mechanics lien in grandma. Also, final resting places become more final when the body is property of the law. Once a body is in the ground, the power of the family to direct anything about it goes away. Once you are inhumed, you cannot be exhumed without court permission. This requires that the party seeking to move or remove your body be brought, bring a petition before the court and call, show good cause for why it should be granted. The law will otherwise jealously protect the remains of a decedent placed in their final resting place. Now, there are factors that govern when we move a human body, when we don't move a human body, when we grant permission to exhume and reinter. Those factors can be the degree of relationship that the party who is seeking the exhumation and reinterment bears to the decedent and the strength of that relationship. A, a parent or a child is going to have a stronger relationship than a cousin or a nephew and therefore a stronger interest under these factors. The degree of a relationship the party seeking to prevent the reinterment bears to the decedent, just the converse of the first. The desire of the decedent, including a general presumption that courts apply that decedents once placed in the ground do not want their remains disturbed, or a specific statement of desire. The conduct of the party seeking to reinter the body, especially as it may relate to the circumstances of the original internment, meaning how have they acted? Have they withheld the body? Have they been overly litigious concerning the corpse? Have they, uh, in the past, tried to block the internment originally? The conduct of a person seeking to prevent the reinternment, how have they acted? The length of time that has elapsed since the original internment, that's right. The closer you are to original internment, the more likely it is to be granted to have them moved. The longer away you are, the more the court says, if this was so important to you, you really should have done it earlier. And the strength of the reasons offered in favor of and in opposition of reinternment. Now, these cases... Uh, these factors really come from a case called Culp v. Culp, a Pennsylvania Superior Court case of 2007. The Superior Court in Pennsylvania being our mid-level appellate court for civil matters not involving the bot, not involving the the Commonwealth in general. And why is this an issue? Why why is court permission for exhumation and reinterment? An issue. Well, let's consider a few examples. First, uh, let's think that two parents are getting a divorce. Their child had died years before and was cremated, and while they were married, they kept the child's body in an urn on their fireplace. Now they're getting divorced, and one parent wants the ashes divided equally amongst them so they each have a piece of their child. The other parent 
is stridently opposed to the division of ashes and wants a cemetery plot purchased and the ashes interred therein. What's the right decision? Example two, a, a man's buried in his family graveyard, which doesn't have enough room to bury his widow and his minor child there. His child grows up to adulthood, purchases a cemetery plot big enough for all three of them. All right. His widow then says, after burying their child, I want to move my husband's body, my poor deceased husband's body, to be in this new graveyard with us so we can be buried together. She seeks to have him dug up and reburied at the new plot, but his siblings object, saying that he should remain buried in the family graveyard. What's the right decision? Or a famous athlete does, and his widow arranges for him to be buried in a town that he has never been to, has no connection with, never stayed in, never endorsed, never been related to whatsoever. The town offers to pay the burial expenses, to build a monument to him on top of his grave, and to rename themselves after him. This is purely done as a tourist attraction. Decades later, decades after his death, his children bring a lawsuit seeking to have his remains disinterred and move to another cemetery in their home state where he is from that respects him, his heritage, and honors his legacy. What's the right decision? Well, I can tell you what the right decision was in the eyes of the court because no matter how far-fetched those sound, each one of those is drawn from an actual case. The first example, Culp v. Culp, is the two parents who had the child that died years before. And the court gave them a series of options. And then it got overturned in front of the Superior Court saying you need to apply these factors in making a determination. And interestingly held that the for the case of ashes, at least within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, internment occurs the moment the ashes are placed in a final disposition, whether they're in the ground or not. So once you put grandma on the mantelpiece in the home, she has been interned in a determination of whether the ashes should be split or their nature changed or go with one person or another person is a change in the internment, a removal legally the same as digging up the body and putting it in another cemetery. And it got remanded, of course, back to the county court there. Uh, no word on how they decided. The second case is actually a case known as Pettigrew v. Pettigrew in Pennsylvania from 1904. And in that case, the court determined that given that the wife and the child had discussed with him prior to his death a desire that they all be buried together, and the court finding that testimony credible, that the widow's request to move the corpse so they could all lie together would be granted. And the third example is actually a 2013 case that went all the way up to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, we referenced it earlier, and that is Thorpe v. Burrow of Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe was a famous Olympian, an athlete, and a Native American. When he died in California, his widow negotiated with a town known as Mock Chunk in Pennsylvania to have his remains placed there under a monument to him. And in return for this, the town advertised itself as the burial place of the legendary Jim Thorpe, who many of you are for the first time ever hearing about, and changed its name to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, despite him having no other relation to the town whatsoever. His children, decades later, said, we want dad's bones dug up and moved back to the reservation at Oklahoma that he grew up on. 
the Third Circuit came in and said no. First Judge Caputo, who was the Middle District Justice on this, said it's not a property issue. It involves another law that we'll talk about here in a moment. And then the Third Circuit said, no, it doesn't matter. We're not going to dig him up. He's, he's gone. He's gone. He's been there for a long fucking time. We're not going to dig him up. Which leads us to a good question. Can I own someone else's corpse? Well, first of all, that's a terrifying question to ask. I have some serious questions about your well-being. But the answer is generally yeah and, and no. Uh, you, you need to define what is meant by corpse in this situation. I mean, can you own a skeleton or a piece of a skeleton? Probably, as long as it's legally obtained. There are few laws within the United States restricting the ownership of defleshed skeletons. But can you own somebody's entire body? Very unlikely. Most states have regulations in effect demanding human remains be buried or properly disposed of within a specific time period as issues of public health and, additionally, require permits for the disposition of a body to be obtained by the funeral home or funeral director and can deny those based on the proposed disposition of the body. Very unlikely you're going to find someone that will let you just hand out dad's big toe. But the devil, as always, is in the details. While there may not be laws that specifically prohibit you from owning human remains in your state, there are definitely questions that you should ask yourself about whether you should. First, as discussed, there are laws regarding and barring the abuse of corpses, which likely in many jurisdictions would include the removal of body parts or defleshing of skeletal fragments such as skulls or the removal of specific parts from a human body. The mutilation that is so offensive to the ordinary family that it falls under that criminal portion. As a result, many of the real skulls and bones that you can buy online and yes, this is a thing, are actually farmed from human corpses in countries such as China and oftentimes from the bodies of prisoners. And if you follow the news, China is not known for its humane treatment of prisoners. This is a perfect example, by the way, of how legal and moral are not always the same thing. You may legally be allowed to own a skull. But if that skull comes from the body of an executed prisoner who is executed for a minor offense in China or another country that would allow that, are you morally in the right? Likewise, Sometimes the law does bar ownership of human remains. The National Organ Transplant Act makes it illegal to purchase or sell organs for transplantation purposes. They can only be donated. Likewise, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act makes it illegal to buy, sell, or own any Native American remains. So, here's some questions. Considering that they have no real property right, except for the purposes of burial, can a family member sue someone for abuse of a corpse? Say you find out that a funeral director is fucking grandpa's body. Can you sue that funeral director? Well, yes and no. You certainly can, but you can't do it on the grounds of property law because the family, as we covered, has only a quasi-property interest in a human body. 
any cause of action for abuse of the corpse is generally going to be found in contract law, such as if a funeral director abuses the corpse, or on the grounds of intentional infliction of emotional distress. And there are some cases out there that have held that it is such an outrageous conduct, even though the tort of intentional affliction of emotional distress is very limited, is such an outrageous conduct to abuse a corpse that close family members can make that claim and possibly win. There was a case in Pennsylvania, Zawatsky, where the question was a, a gentleman killed his stepdaughter and abused the corpse horrifically. For a long period of time, the stepdaughter's husband and children sued for intentional infliction of emotional distress. And the court found that that conduct was so outrageous that absent any other things, they are in the zone of harm. The people expect it to be injured and it could stand. An additional one would be such as negligent mishandling of a corpse. Uh, that tends to arise in contract situations, though, such as with funeral directors. But could you sue under conversion or trespass? No, because those are property-based torts. And a human body is not property of anyone but the court. So to wrap it up, you have, no property right in your own corpse, and neither does your family. While you can direct the disposition of your remains, it is contingent that the disposition you have chosen is legal and reasonable and not unduly burdensome. And while your family has a quasi-property right in your remains, it is only for the purposes of burial or disposition and stops the moment a final interment has taken place, be it by burial or placement of your ashes. Legally, the only party that ostensibly has an ownership power over a human corpse is the law. And much of our property view of a human body comes from moral or health concerns and ancient ecclesiastical law to make sure that we don't anger judgmental sky grandpa. The law expects that a human corpse will be treated with respect and not as mere property or a commodity. That ends the presentation portion of tonight's stream. So, as always, when we do these, we take a, a few questions from our Patreon supporters in the Discord channel. I'm going to bring that up. We're going to cover a few of those right now and go over some questions that have been asked regarding this. Let me scroll up. Wow. Like I said, I was talking about dead bodies and, and these motherfuckers went crazy. Holy shit. There's pages. Like last week, when I'm talking about shit, I had like three fucking questions. This week, you assholes went all out. <clears throat> oh my god, I'm still scrolling. <clears throat> let's see, let's see, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Ah, here we go. This is uh, from Quaxum Mephedida, who states, My five-time great-grandfather's grave, along with other family members, is in a seemingly abandoned cemetery in the middle of bumfuck PA. The church that founded said cemetery was dissolved about 100 years ago and supposedly absorbed into another nearby church. Said church does not appear to have any interest in maintenance or funding of the cemetery, with the exception of an Eagle Scout project in the early 90s. There does not appear to be any maintenance of the cemetery at all. So, my questions are, is it trespassing if I simply walked into the cemetery, tended to my ancestor's grave, cut down various wild shrubberies in the immediate vicinity, and filled dirt into the ground around them to prevent them from falling? 
What legal responsibilities does whomever is the owner of said cemetery have for the maintenance of it? And what recourse would there be if said owner is incapable of maintenance? I accept the standard boozy legal funhouse disclaimer and certify I will not claim a badger on the internet told me this was okay. I'll go into the last two first. Generally, there is no requirement for maintenance. Uh, that there now the laws in many states are such that when you purchase a gravesite, when you buy a burial plot, uh, you make a contribution from a portion of that price into what is called a perpetual care trust. These days, what that means is there is a trust out there accruing interest and making wise investments. And those investments, once the graveyard is full or, say, the cemetery company goes bankrupt, uh, will continue to fund care for the cemetery grounds for as long as the trust is in existence held by separate trustees. The truth of the matter is most graveyards uh, came into existence before the establishment or the requirements for such trusts, depending on your jurisdiction. Most older cemeteries did not have that. Uh, where the cemetery corporation has gone bankrupt, there is generally no requirement that they maintain it. Uh, this actually is not uncommon. There's a graveyard in Philadelphia that has that same thing, and there is now a nonprofit group that is engaged in maintenance and clearing out of that cemetery. However, is it considered trespassing for you to go in and do maintenance on your relatives' graves? No, not really, as long as it does not disturb any other land. Pennsylvania law requires that a family member have reasonable access to a gravesite of a family member. So, yes, you generally can go. You generally can care for those graves. You cannot destroy or disturb the other graves around it. Dragor asked, my day job is at a rather large obituary company and we hear all sorts of interesting things on the customer service side. Let's say the last parent of two siblings dies, and those siblings do not get along. Each one submits an obituary. Is there any legal requirement that there can be only one? My day job effectively enforces a whoever submits first situation, and then after that it tends to fall on the estate to rectify anything or transfer ownership of said obituary. But there's many places where several obituaries can be submitted, and they do not coordinate with each other. No, there is no requirement that, uh, that somebody file an obituary first or generally that I'm aware of. And this can be different. Probate law, funeral law, death law, very jurisdiction specific. There's nothing barring more than one obituary from being submitted. I can understand the company's position, which is we've already received an obituary for this person. We're not going to take another one. Uh, if somebody were to sue for it, they'd probably point out that the first obituary is normally submitted by the funeral home. Uh, so whoever is handling the burial would likely be the one determining uh, the obituary terms. Question for nine, is there any way to make sure your last wishes are fulfilled? A writing, a notarized writing that meets the... Uh, the requirements in your state, as we had discussed, as an expression of your last wishes for the disposition uh, of your body. Keeping in mind, some dispositions will not be honored simply because of how they were. Uh, head Fox has stated, if I choose to be buried, does it have to be in a typical metal casket in a concrete vault? Or can they just dump my meat suit into a hole and fill it up? Once again, wonderful question. Great question. The Depends on where the fuck you are. Uh, the fact of the matter is there is no single answer 
it's very jurisdiction specific. I, I do hear that the sound blipped. If it's okay, I'm fine. Uh, the in Pennsylvania, for example, uh, there's actually no requirement that you be buried in a casket. We have other regulatory means regarding burial grounds and where bodies can be placed in relation to groundwater and such that do not require caskets. There's no requirement of a casket in Pennsylvania for burial. There's no requirement of a casket in Pennsylvania for cremation, but that is only legally. The cemetery you're being placed in may require the ground vault. The cemetery you're being placed in may require a casket. But under the law itself, there's no requirement for a casket or a vault or anything of that nature. But that's got to differ depending on what state you're in. <clears throat> Let's see. How long does a funeral home have to hold on to remains until they can declare them unclaimed and give them a pauper's burial? Once again, state-specific. It is a state-specific determination as to the disposition of unclaimed remains. Uh, many states have a very specific law regarding that. As a matter of fact, hold on. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what it is in Pennsylvania in just a moment. Pennsylvania, unclaimed remains. We'll Google it right here. We're doing it fucking live. Pennsylvania, unclaimed remains. Uh-uh. When a body is unidentified or unclaimed by a proper person, it is given to the coroner and disposed of on that. How long do they keep unclaimed bodies? Generally, a body in Illinois, it says, must be held for 30 days before it. Uh, yeah, I, I, it depends specifically on the state. The state's going to have a law saying that. Uh, what is the deal with exhumations and why do they appear to be a big legal hassle? Once again, the courts, uh, and I'll, I'll clarify this, we talked about it, uh, but courts and the law generally presume that once somebody's in the ground, it is their intent to be there. Uh, what is the best way, from C.C. Otter, what is the best way for trans folks to deal with their final wishes? I.e. avoiding parents or siblings from being in charge and dead naming misgendering? That's a very good question. The best way is to determine if your state allows you to designate somebody outside of the next of kin provisions to act as the decision maker for your state. If they do, Pennsylvania does, uh, Texas does. If they do, Fill that paperwork out with an attorney. Go to an attorney to make that idea, to make that designation. Fill that paperwork out and make sure it's circulated. Prepay for your burial. Prepay at the funeral home. Circulate it to your health care providers. Give it to the hospital. Make everyone aware of that. And then act quickly if the family steps in to try to say we are the presumed next of kin and bring that paperwork in. Make sure whoever you're appointing is willing to do so. Maybe set aside a little bit for a lawyer to fight that and file a petition. <clears throat> Let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, how does donate my body to science work? A friend of mine works at a facility in Philadelphia where they dismember corpses to sell various parts to labs or schools. What are you talking? What you are talking about is an anatomical gift, and in many states they have adopted what is called the uniform anatomical an, anatomical anato anatomy anatomy. Ah, fuck it! The uniform body gift act. You gets to cut shit off and give it to people. Uh, many states have adopted that, saying that for purposes of research, for science, for medical research, uh, that their body can be made one of those gifts that is a legally recognized way of doing it. Anything else that we have? Uh, green burial in general we kind of covered. Corruption of death we kind of covered. My God, there's so much fucking stuff here. 
How illegal is it for funeral homes to steal the bones of the dead, replacing them with PVC piping and selling them for transplant? That's a real case. That is a real case. Uh, the, the host of Masterpiece Theater on PBS had that happen to his body. When it died, they were saying that they were cremating them. What they were doing was they were cutting out parts without consent of the family or an anim animatomic body gift uh, out there. And they were doing that on there. That That's a real case. It's amazingly illegal. And the people who, who were convicted of it spent a good chunk of time in jail as a result. Uh, that is a real case. Uh, let's see, anything else here? What legal hurdles do you overcome to use human remains to create art? You really don't have to. Uh, once the remains are there, they can be used to create jewelry, to create pieces of art, uh, anything like that. You want to make sure that, uh, that you're not going to get sued for it uh, or that it's being in a respectful way uh, on that. Uh, the Mutter Museum is a little different on a lot of these. Is there anything else here? Jesus Christ. Uh, body worlds. We're not going to go in that. Jesus Christ. All right. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think that's it. Uh, I think that's it for those. We'll uh, we'll go to the other chat, the, the stream chat uh, for the last 10 minutes and address any questions that may be coming in here. Uh, if you have them, please feel free to put them in. For those of you listening along later, this is the part of it where I just talk aimlessly as I wait for questions to show up in there because we do record this, if you weren't aware, live every Monday evening. It's why you're going to hear so many stutters, so many errors, blips in sound every now and again, things like that. Because we record this live, and I like to keep the live experience going for those of you who listen later on the podcast. Uh, let's see. Was it the reason it was discovered by right? the PBS host was because someone who had received bone marrow transplants got the same extremely rare cancer he died from? Yes, that was actually part of the way it was discovered. Actually, it was discovered during an inspection because funeral homes are inspected. It was discovered during an inspection where they uncovered the chop shop with body parts still in it. They were able to track down the fact that uh, that several other people came out with that cancer uh, that he had died from. Uh, Quack Quack Honk has stated in at least one state you can have your remains turned into wild animal chow. Well, I think that may be it for our questions tonight. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody for coming by live. I want to thank those who are listening at home. I greatly appreciate you all being here. If you're listening on your favorite podcasting service, uh, I would ask you please rate it. Give me a five and send me an email to tell me to go fuck off. I'm fine with that. I just want the rating. Like, give me five stars, then tell me I'm a piece of shit and you didn't enjoy any of it. And until next week, I am the Boozy Barrister, Boozy Badger. This has been Boozy's Legal Funhouse. And thank you all for joining me. Give me a second.